Most of my roots are here in Middle Tennessee. My mother's family had uh, a small farm in what's now the land between the lakes in Stewart County, Tennessee. My father's people were tenant farmers in Montgomery County and the neighboring county. Uh, they were living at my mother's home place when I was about to be delivered and because she had difficulty with the pregnancy we had to go to a hospital. Well the, the closest hospital was Murray, Kentucky. So technically I'm a native of, of Kentucky but I've spent most of my life in Tennessee. I was a sickly child. My dad moved to Arizona with my mom and me. Actually we encountered a physician in Arizona who had retired as the head of pediatrics at Vanderbilt Medical School retired and practiced out there who sent me to Tucson, found out that I had a blood deficiency that was correctable, corrected it, and then when I was nine we came back to Tennessee. So it's a remarkable story. We had lived less than 50 miles from where this man had been teaching, but we had to go to Arizona to meet him. Probably my first strong influence was my great aunt, uh, my mother's aunt Minerva. And uh, when I was a small child in Stewart County, my Aunt Minerva was the oldest person, my great Aunt Minerva was the oldest person in the household. I was maybe three or four years old. She was in her 70s at that time. And while everybody else did the work they thought was important around the house, we would sit out on the porch in the porch swing and she would tell me stories and sing me songs. It was a storytelling tradition that was passed along to me very early on in my childhood. And I know that's where my interest in storytelling began. When I was in graduate school at Northwestern, there was a teacher there named Barbara McDermott. And um, in a class I took with her, she said um, to me one day, you know you're a storyteller, don't you? Well, I hadn't thought of that. And I realized that not only did I already know a number of stories, but that was the, the way that was most comfortable for me in communicating. I went to school uh, here across the street at Vanderbilt. My major was theater. I minored in religion and English, but my major was theater. When I went to seminary, I didn't expect to serve local churches. I expected to be a teacher. I went to seminary at uh, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, which is the United Methodist Seminary on the campus at Northwestern University. I primarily went there for the theater school at Northwestern, which is one of the best in the country. Um, Garrett is a good seminary too. I was able to take classes at Garrett and at Northwestern, and then I was very fortunate when I finished my Master of Divinity, there was fellowship money available to continue work, and I was encouraged to do that. So uh, I was able to do my PhD work in between the departments of religion and speech and theater. My interest was in actually creating art, in creating something that had religious significance. Not just kind of religious propaganda, but something that would go deep in the same way those stories from Scripture go deep. Dealing with all the ambiguities that we experience in life and yet finding God in there somewhere. And I use all of that all the time. It's not just in preaching, it's in teaching. Um, the, the things I learned in those classes, I use day in and day out. I really do. The learning process uh, in coming to a new church has several levels. One a very obvious level is that you have to learn hundreds of new names. I remember when I went to Columbia many, many years ago, and uh, a young woman came up to me very first day and said, Hi there, my name is Connie Marks. I'm going to tell you that until you tell me to stop. And every time she came up to me, she would say, Hello, my name is Connie Marks. I will never forget her name. She didn't expect me to remember it after the first time. She knew I had a lot of names to remember. And she continued to remind me until I said, Hey, Connie, that's fine. I know. I'm encouraging that. <laughs> that's why I told that story. <laughs> That's one level of learning. Another level of learning really is the culture of the church, the way things are done. And I tend to come in and try to enter into and learn the culture. I'm, I'm not a person who tries to upset the basket right at first because it seems to me that if you're going to be effective, you have to be effective within what people are already doing, within what they already expect. Much of a senior pastor's job is in working with staff and lay leadership 
so that each of those groups is really empowered and given resources to do what they're called to do. They, in turn, empower others within the congregation to do that. And there is a certain satisfaction in seeing people come to sense their calling and then go to live it out, or in seeing a conflict that could have been destructive managed in such a way that it becomes creative instead. For me, a part of, of what my job is, is to look at where you all say that God is calling you and leading you and to say, okay, now, how are you doing that? Hold your feet to the fire and you hold my feet to the fire to be true to that calling. And if that's not what we're called to do, then we need to figure out what it is we're called to do and do it. But a part of what I have to do in any church, but certainly here, is to say, okay, out of this process of discernment and discovery, you have discovered this is where God is calling you. What are you doing to get there? How do we get there? How do we provide the resources, the mechanism, the uh, opportunities to go where God is calling us? Well, my preaching style, that's interesting. What is my preaching style? I never write sermons, okay? I prepare myself to preach in the same way that I would prepare to tell a story. Now that doesn't mean all of my sermons are just stories, but they're prepared to be delivered orally. And it seems to me there's a different process that you use, and in fact I've taught this in various places, a process that is different from preparing a document like a sermon. It's a way of preparing that sometimes takes more time and effort than actually writing it out. But that's because it does take rehearsal. That's because you do try to hear the way words sound. You'll try out phrases to see how they sound, not just how they read on, on a page. And so it's not just kind of standing up and, and letting the wind of the Spirit blow through your ears, you know, like there's nothing in between. It requires rehearsal so that when I stand, I'm ready to present without reading. I find the energy that's between the listener and the speaker is much greater if you don't have to read. Every story, every narrative should provide an entry into the scripture for that day. Should provide some way of all of us, listener and, and, and speaker alike, walking into that text. Because I, I fell in love with those, those stories of the Bible when I was a kid. And I'm still learning things from them. I'm still realizing things that um, I never saw before in stories I have literally heard for over 50 years. I had never imagined being the senior minister at West End. My excitement grows with every meeting. I mean, I know there will be struggles, and just struggles to remember names to start with, but um, I'm really excited about coming here. I, I look forward to our working together. I really do think that West End has a unique place within this conference and within this city and I'm excited about being a part of helping it claim that place because there's a great tradition here, a long and honored tradition, and it's not that we could go back to that or any other stage, but building on that, we can build new traditions and extend those traditions into the future.